मेरे नबी सा कोई मेरे नबी Hello everyone and welcome to the second ever edition of Realities podcast. Yes, it's the program that looks at people and the meaning they give to what they do, the meaning they give to the world around them. People who follow some kind of drive and we get to learn about it, listen to it here on this program. My name is Mark Fonseca Rendeiro and today on the program a good friend of my podcasts over the years Shafir Rahman he's a documentary maker he does projects with a social and political angle the kinds of projects you rarely if ever hear about or see in this world and yet extremely powerful extremely important this really is giving a voice to the voiceless and I'm very happy to have him today this was recorded at the end of 2015 uh still as valid as ever if not more so let's go Um, so for for those who don't know, right? Uh, Shafir Rahman is someone who I've known uh, over the years. I don't know how many years, Shafir. It's it's maybe six. <laughs> no, it's longer than that because last time you uh, we asked you to be part of the jury that was in two thousand and ten. So it must be before that. So. Yeah. In fact, it might have been a garment worker film that we first. Yes, that's right. So that was two thousand and six, man. Go. We, we had a screening of that film in Amsterdam. Oh screening. yeah, yeah, two thousand. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So uh, quite a few years. Yeah, which which you know, so there's lots to talk about, and how to organize it is perhaps one of the things we could go in reverse order. <laughs> um, what what really got me uh, wanting to hear from you, and and really to share what you're doing with people, uh, is the current project, or at least one of the current projects that you're busy with when it comes to you know. So first of all, for those listening, um, as you're going to hear. Uh, Shafir himself it makes, uh, among other things, makes documentaries. Uh, but not only that, you're also you also do actual social and and political projects. I mean, is that social and political? Is that the right way to call them? I, I think so, Mark. I I don't see myself as a filmmaker per se. I see myself more of a social activist who uses the medium of film. So yes, I'm often in, engaged in uh, social and political projects. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So how do you, I mean, this will get more about your, how you work, because I think people are also interested in that, but we won't forget the, the, the real issues. But so how do you organize your, you know, your week these days, for, you know, for example, uh, between projects that you're working on? Um, well, this year has been quite exciting, actually. Uh, um, I think uh, we had, a, a, I've been filming for Rai Television, uh, which is Italian public television, and we were working on um, uh, uh, the shrimp industry, uh, prawns, mm. um, and uh, the impact of the shrimp industry on uh, on the environment. It's something I didn't know about. I love prawns. I love eating prawns. <laughs> and I had no idea that uh, the devastation it was... Uh, uh, you know, creating in certain parts of the world. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we went to one region where 8,000 hectares uh, of mangrove swamps uh, have just disappeared. Uh, it's not there anymore. It's been cut down uh, for shrimp farming. Um, this is in Bangladesh. This is in Bangladesh. Mm. So uh, to answer your question, you know, when I'm not away filming these things, um, uh, you know, we're in London editing uh, these things. And uh, there's some other projects that we're also involved in this year. Uh, I can discuss them right right now. But uh, yeah. Why, 
Yeah, can we let's start in Bangladesh and then we're going to we're going to go to some other countries if, if you have time and if you're yeah. willing. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you're someone who has taught me a lot about Bangladesh. I have not been there. Um, so first of you all, did invite you, Mark. Yeah, you did. I know. And you know what? I was I had all kinds of young student excuses back then, but I think I think these excuses have to come to an end and I think uh, yeah, let's let's do this. <laughs> I'm I'm much more prepared to to do what is necessary these days oh. um but so yeah you know you in bangladesh first of all for those that don't know as they listen you explain just a little bit about your um your connection to bangladesh because we have potentially all new people listening sure uh i was born there then my family emigrated to england uh to to scotland actually um and uh I've lived in the UK ever since, but I've always had an attachment to Bangladesh. Um, and I like places which, uh, well, w usually uh, if a place has three attributes, I really, really fall in love with it. Uh, hmm. One is good food. <laughs> uh, uh, another is uh, beautiful scenery. And the other is bad politics. And I think Bangladesh oh. has uh, all these. So that's why I like it so much. I, I expected the first two. The third one, okay, right. <laughs> that, one, that one attracts you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when we first met, we had been, I, I was, of course, very interested in the issue that remains an issue uh, of the garment workers. And that is indeed how, one way anyway, how Bangladesh ties into everybody's life in this world, it seems to me. Um, it's, it's still an issue and I, I, I would actually like to hold it for a second, but that's, that's how we first started speaking. But then I remember within a year or two, you taught me about, uh, you taught us about, um, the stateless people, yeah. the Bihari people who live in, uh, essentially refugee camps f for generations at this point. Am I, am I overstating yeah. it? No, no. Uh, and, and so now the, the shrimping industry, I mean, that's, that's another aspect and, which also connects to the world. Am I? Am I right? I mean, how how much are we talking about? Obviously, shrimp for domestic consumption, but is this also a major source for the world? Absolutely. Um, the the shrimp industry uh, exports mainly to Europe, to to America, to the Far East, and uh, we investigated a large European importer, the biggest importer in the UK. Um, and we traced uh, the, the prawns back right down to the village. Uh, and we found all sorts of issues. We found child labor. Uh, we found um, conflicts resulting in, you know, la uh, dispossession of land, uh, 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 shootings, uh, quite a myriad of problems uh, connected to the shrimp industry. Um, so, yes, it's absolutely unknown. But the, the, the most devastating aspect of this is the huge deforestation. And together with that, the, uh, because a lot of this uh, shrimp farming is done with salty water, and as a result, you can't grow anything else in those areas. Um, so it's resulted in agricultural productivity declining as well. Um, so yeah. So so they're taking land that wasn't uh, that was well, for example, agricultural, and they're making it into a a salty uh, place where shrimp are raised. Correct. Yes, as well as cutting back. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, mangrove swamps and uh, using those areas for shrimp farming. And, and I mean, who came up with this? I, I guess it's harder to trace, but, you know, uh, who, who said let's, was it a sort of top down thing where either the government encouraged it or companies came in or, or, or did people uh, sort of want to do this? How did this happen? Yeah, that. That's a very interesting question. I, I think it happened uh, almost by accident. Um, when the floods happen in southern Bangladesh, uh, a lot of seawater comes in uh, to inland areas. Uh, people soon realized that, hang on a minute, uh, when the salt water wasn't going away, uh, they realized uh, this was a great uh, way to uh, farm shrimp. And of course, uh, shrimp is quite profitable. So it almost uh, came about by accident. But then large landowners, vested interests, uh, particularly political vested interests, decided this was a good way of uh, uh, starting an industry. 
And a lot of people lost their land as a result because they didn't want to go into shrimp farming, but they were forced to go into shrimp farming. Uh, they were forced to surrender their land to big landowners and uh, uh, through, uh, you know, thugs attacking them. And in one case uh, where, you know, people were shot dead. Hmm. And you've managed access to these places and, and, and what are, I mean, what are people saying to you if, if they're brave enough to talk to you? Well, um, they are saying that uh, if they had any other opportunity, they would take it. Uh, shrimp farming is uh, extremely uh, valuable and uh, it's profitable. But in areas where there's been tremendous social conflict, uh, those who are for traditional farming, other uh, crops, etc., they've managed to roll back uh, uh, shrimp farming. So it's a mixed picture where in some areas uh, shrimp farming has really taken hold and other areas where the other farming practices have come back in as people have have realized that this results in uh, social differentiation, some people getting poorer, some people getting far richer. Uh, they realized that this was not the way to uh, take their uh, livelihoods forward. Um, and those areas have been quite, uh, well, they've been organized, some are organized into trade unions, and those trade unions have played an active role in rolling back uh, ship farming. Unfortunately, the documentary is in Italian because, of course, it's an Italian document, uh, Italian company, mm -hmm. um, public television. And uh, so I, it, it is online, but uh, it's in Italian. Hmm. Maybe we could put the community of translators to work. Uh, there's yeah. lots of great people always doing such things. Um, I'll, I'll definitely link to it and actually try it myself with my limited Italian. I, I may be able to pick up a lot. Um, Cool. Uh, one thing I'm wondering is, you know, again, we started today by talking about how long you and I have been in contact over the years. And I know, you know, some things move very slowly. Uh, I always had this hope and or naive uh, thinking that, you know, in 10 years, 10 years ago, um, uh, for example, Bangladesh, but I thought about this for many places in the world, um, uh, people will start to demand and governments will, will, will have to start with better for example, uh, uh, rules regarding safety in the workplace, regarding child labor. And I know it's a kind of too general of a question. So if you want to apply it to different sectors, uh, go for it. But I'm wondering, you know, do you see increasing standards? Uh, it, well, it, I mean, obviously I was being somewhat naive, but, but are things changing that indicate a better understanding, a better concern for, for people and the land? Yeah, sure. Um, well, let me apply it to the garment sector. Uh, two years ago, I made a film again for Italian public TV for Rai Tre, uh, which was an expose or Benetton, and, uh, which is the big fashion brand, uh, as you know. Mm -hmm. And we used uh, secret cameras uh, to film Benetton managers uh, talking about uh, child labor. Um, Benetton managers know that child labor exists in the uh, factories that they use. And in fact, this particular manager um, said quite explicitly, you know, uh, the church would condone the use of child labor because the alternatives are, are far worse. He's obviously referring to, well, look, look, if they don't do this, they're going to starve and they're not they're going to be out in the streets. And right, so right. It's the old defense um, of it, yeah. Yeah, it's the classic kind of defense. Um, so... Uh, you would have expected, um, remember Bangladesh at one point banned all child labor. So you'd have expected, of course, that's a very crude way of approaching it, uh, but you'd have expected some change and you'd have expected big companies like Benetton to be particularly uh, concerned about their reputation um, uh, you know, in the, in, amongst their Western consumers. Yeah. But uh, clearly not. This is uh, merely two years ago. And again, uh, I'll, I'll give you the link. And this one is, there is an English version, so um, you, you can have a look. But uh, it's quite clear that things haven't changed. And as you said, one would have expected that uh, 10 years ago when we were talking about these things that uh, we may have 
entertain some hope. Um, and is there any hope within the garment sector? Well, some people allude to, you know, after Rana Plaza, they allude to, you know, the big factory collapse that happened, which mm-hmm. claimed the lives of 1,200 workers. They, they allude to, uh, you know, the initiatives underway to look at fire safety, uh, building safety, um, you know, the cord and alliance approaches uh, that are taking place at the moment. But there are even problems with that. Um, they are uh, closing down factories, but in, in the process of closing down factories, thousands of workers are losing their livelihoods. They don't have access to the remuneration package that they ought to receive when a factory is closed down. Mm -hmm. because it's being done by these foreign organizations which are coming in, assessing the building, assessing the fire safety, and then slapping a closure order on these. So uh, one would have thought that maybe things were changing, but uh, it's very uneven, the picture. Do do you have an impression of what happens once the factories close when it comes to do they then these companies create new ones with you know the, the standards we could hope for, or do, are they leaving the country? Um, well, there is a concern that uh, foreign buyers will leave the country. Um, we certainly know anecdotally, and it's something that we're exploring right now, that uh, they're very against the new ideas about unionization, about having worker committees. And uh, they make it quite clear if these start having an impact, they're going to pull away from Bangladesh. That's uh, that they make clear. Um, So whilst we haven't seen, I don't know the latest figures, but obviously I haven't seen anything in the press, companies are not withdrawing from Bangladesh. But at the same time, uh, there are these threats that they will if... uh, for example, if unions are allowed to form, etc. Again, I had never heard of this before you enlightened me. Uh, River Gypsies, a, a group in Bangladesh. Uh, can you, I mean, you're, you're doing work about these communities, about the people. Um, how did this start for you? And of course, since so many people listening haven't heard of them, if you could explain a little. Mark, imagine a community where a woman's work is to dress up and to suck blood. And a man's work is to catch snakes or play tricks. Uh, this is the life of the Bede. Uh They are very little known. I'm not surprised that you know your, your listeners don't know about them. They are very little known indigenous uh, people from Bangladesh, numbering uh, between 800,000 and a million people. Um, mm. So how I came about, uh, you know, working with them and filming them, well, it was... Uh, a, a nice afternoon, I was driving along Dhaka and I saw these three feisty young women, these women who suck blood. Um, they, you know, and just talking to them, their energy, their feistiness, right? and I, I decided there and then, look, I must explore uh, this community mm. much more. Um, I mean, immediately, a lot of things attracted to me. You know, they, This is a community which... Um, refuses to conform, they have their own customs, their own occupations, their own hereditary occupations, I say, I should say, uh, their own traditions in, in, in love and death, their, their own language, um, and of course, magic. Uh, so it was absolutely fascinating, very different from the kind of stuff I do. Um, but I thought, you know, this is, uh, this is a community uh, worth following. And of course, they're extremely impoverished. They're excluded, they're uh, uh, pretty much marginalized by the mainstream community. Um, They they live a very separate existence. Um, They don't figure in the labor market at all. They they don't figure in the huge garment industry, uh, nor the uh, equally large labor export industry that we have in, in Bangladesh. 
uh, they are not registered as voters. They were only given the vote uh, in 2008 um, hmm. because the military-backed government at the time uh, were intent on seeking uh, democratic credentials, so they wanted as many people as possible to get the vote. So they are a typical pariah community, um, living on the margins of society with their own rituals and customs, um, and looking very different. I mean, not as in racially or anything like that, but the way they dress, etc. cetera. Um, and that's what attracted to me, uh, attracted uh, me to them, yeah. Not, not to get bogged down in details, but uh, what is the blood sucking for? Yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I should explain. That. Medical? <laughs> they don't just go around uh, uh, sucking blood. No, this is part of their um, alternative medicine that they provide. They sell all sorts of trinkets. They sell all sorts of herbal medicines. Um, and one of the things that they do is... Um, uh, it's, it's cupping, you know, like uh, it, it, it's, it's actually worldwide. Cupping or bloodletting is, is a practice you see everywhere. It makes me think of leeches in the old days. Yeah, exactly. So they will make an incision. They will, um, I'll send you a link to a video of this, and then they will draw out the blood. Uh, and this blood is supposed to take away your pain, say if you have back pain or something like that. Um, and one of the things is this kind of medicine, uh, alternative medicine that they offer, there's very little demand for these products these days. Um, and that's another aspect of uh, why these uh, gypsies are, are struggling uh, to blend into mainstream society. But, so when you approach such a community, you've just talked about their isolation. It, it sounds a bit familiar, uh, although I know, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the same experience as gypsies in, uh, in say, Italy, for example. But I, I hear some similarities. But how do you, uh, as someone who brings, for example, I believe at some point you bring cameras. Uh, yeah. Uh, how hard it is, how, how do you manage to get their permission for such things? Yeah, this was a considerable challenge. Um, uh, the river gypsies are distrustful of uh, outsiders, uh, but I managed to win their confidence. Um, and I did so by um, using uh, the advice and suggestions of uh, Father Renato Rosso. He is a missionary and he's been working amongst gypsies throughout the world. Uh, in Brazil, in Armenia, in India, in Israel, in Palestine. Uh, he goes everywhere and he lives with gypsies. He actually stays for months and months and he's been living with gypsies in Bangladesh now for over 30 years. Um, so he made some introductions for me and connected me with some individuals. And uh, through that, I was able to slowly gain their confidence and, as you say, bring cameras into the scene. And, and at some point, I mean, you... you obviously learn much about the community and uh, enter the, the story of the, among other things, the school. Yes, I mean, you know, one of the things that Bangladesh prides itself in is it, it says that uh, uh, it has, you know, in terms of poverty reduction and improving the quality of life for children, it has made education uh, one of its cornerstones, policy cornerstones. In fact, it's the largest uh, primary, it has the largest primary education system in the world. I, um, however, this doesn't include uh, the river gypsy. Um, and NGOs have tried, uh, uh, Roman Catholic Church has tried. It's very difficult. They live an itinerant life. They are not settled necessarily. Some are, some are not. Um, their way of working is such that uh, the women leave their children with their siblings, older siblings. Therefore, the older siblings are not able to go to school. There are a variety of obstacles why uh, 
you know, these kids uh, cannot go to a mainstream school. Mm. Um, however, in one or two pockets, there are these schools which have been set up either by NGOs or by the Catholic Church. And, um, and the NGOs sometimes receive funding from the government. And they've not been successful, as I say. But this one that I've been involved with, uh, he's been a teacher for some time and he's tried his best uh, to keep going despite the difficulties. And they asked me for help to, to build the school. And uh, that's how I came into the scene. Yeah, it's you know there's um it's it's on GoFundMe which I recommend people go to. Uh, it's it's listed uh, as um, schoolroom for River Gypsy kids, and of course there'll be a link. But if you're if you're somewhere driving or walking and you want to remember, uh, schoolroom for River Gypsy kids, and you have among other things in the description you have the the graphic, which by the way is an amazing image that looks. I mean, it reminds me. Of I, I, something out of a movie. It's it's uh, the the the, the structure is on stilts. It looks like yeah. green is growing. I actually want to see this photo in larger scale. Um, and and you have these uh, statistics or the hard facts, including you know um, that in order for this school to continue to run and retain its teacher until August 2017. So. Yeah, August 2017, I'm visualizing that. It would only cost, uh, and I say only, uh, because I think in many parts of the Western world, this is not a significant sum. Uh, 655 pounds, is that? Yeah, 655, or what? That is about 800 euros or something, mm -hmm. is it? Mm -hmm. uh, something right. like that. Yeah, um, yeah I think uh, it definitely this is a high impact project for a very little amount of money. Um, we would be providing. Uh, education to about 30 Bedi children. And what was particularly kind of motivating for me is when I went there and uh, they were learning English. I mean, it was, uh, it was quite staggering to be in this impoverished community in this, uh, as you say, this, this little hut um, and to hear these uh, little children, uh, you know, uh, learning the English alphabet. And that was quite inspiring, actually. Hmm. Do you, do you um, manage to well find out what happens to the children that have come through the school? I mean, I know you said it's a fairly closed community. It's quite closed community. So I guess there's not going to be many stories of someone uh, getting beyond what is traditional expectation. But I'm, I'm curious if there's any cases that you found of someone uh, managing to get out. Uh, maybe I'm grasping at something that doesn't really happen. No, I, I think that's an important question. And uh, as I said, Bookshed has been a teacher for a long time. And he often points to young adults uh, who are per perhaps passing us as we we're walking along and um, discussing things. He often says, yeah, uh, he, he, he used to be one of my pupils. And these are adults now who are 19, 20, 21, 22. Mm -hmm. Most of them are still tied to their traditional uh, occupations. I think um, this is the difficulty here, that uh, they face such discrimination from the wider community that I, I think it's going to be quite difficult for them to blend into mainstream society. Mm. Uh, and of course, lack of education and skills just makes that worse. Yeah. Well, uh, on the good side, I see people are uh, coming forward, and uh, I, I, I can imagine anyone who's listening will also see how they very easily can get involved. You know, one of the ones I follow your Instagram sphere quite closely, um, and I know you know we're getting to that point with Instagram where people follow so many people they miss they miss a lot. I think, yeah. but um, yours, you know, one of the times that I most noticed your Instagram, or I, I don't know, it it, it most hit me was when you, uh, I believe it was you that went to the um, camps in in Calais. I'm switching now to yeah. to France. Yeah. I mean. I really want to talk about this. Uh, how, how did you first go there? What was the project? And then let's, yeah, we'll talk about some of the details. 
Sure. Um, look, I've been filming Bangladeshi migration from Bangladesh to Libya to Italy um, and and then to Europe for some time. Um, and I've filmed in Libyan detention camps where no other journalists have had access. I've filmed in Maltese detention camps where other journalists haven't had access. And I've filmed Bangladeshis in these places. So I wrote to uh, some NGOs in, working in Calais uh, just saying, look, uh, do you know of any Bangladeshis uh, in, in Calais? They all wrote back to me. Uh, some didn't, but those who did, they, they wrote back to me saying, no, uh, we, there are no, no Bangladeshis. There's Syrians, there's Kurdish, there's Afghanistanis, there's Pakistanis, uh, there's, of course, Sub-Saharan Africans, there's North Africans, but there's no Kurds, uh, there's no Bangladeshis mm -hmm. here. So I thought I'd take a look myself. Um, I'm offered in Bangladesh, we, uh, a, a bunch of us grouped together, we put some money together, we took uh, 300 socks, hats and gloves, which are really, really necessary. Uh, and we went to Cali and uh, immediately we were just uh, in the midst of it. Uh, one of the camp coordinators, uh, the volunteers who distribute all these clothes, he said, look, let's Let's take these fire extinguishers. There's a huge fire in, uh, in the camp. Let's go there immediately. So we were just right in the middle of it. Um, and as we were, I, you, you could, yeah, as we were there, we, it was quite a shocking thing. Uh, we came across a Bangladeshi. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, that's, that's how it all happened, really. Yeah. So, yeah, I took some pictures and posted them on Instagram. Yeah, the, the story of Calais, I mean, for, for people who, especially who are outside of Europe, it may not be a familiar name, but we're, we're talking about the, the refugee camp. That's, it feels like it's existed for probably a decade or more at this point. It's that, that point where many people try and get on, what is it, either trains or uh auto get through Trucks, the, yeah. the, the um, transit under the, the channel to get to the UK. Uh, I believe that's the, the, the universal goal there, right? That's the universal goal. They're, they want to come to the UK for a variety of reasons. They may have family here. Uh, they, uh, some family are documented people here, as in people with papers. Some are undocumented. But for one reason or another, they want to get to the UK. And they risk their life and limb to get onto these trains or these trucks uh, on their way to, to the United Kingdom. I think uh, only on Monday, the 18th person since June uh, uh, died. He was a 60-year-old Sudanese chap. Um, and uh, so you can imagine. And there are many people who have broken limbs trying to get on these trucks um, uh, and, and other moving vehicles. Um, there are about six to 7,000 people in Cali at the moment. The camp has grown and grown. Um, and it's, the conditions there are appalling. Uh, I don't know uh, if it's worth mentioning, but each and every night there are some... Uh, attacked by the police. Uh, there's tear gas fired into the camps. There's, uh, there have been several serious fires in the camps. And I remember, Mark, yeah, this is a camp with not just men, young men, but women and children, very vulnerable people, yeah. people who have fled the most horrendous uh, situations. Yeah. Uh, this Bangladeshi I've talked to, I mean, he's a, he's a walking hero. I mean, how he's managed to get there... He must have more lives than, you know, a cat. I mean, and yet he remains resolved that he has to get to the UK. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen the many reports where, where the, um, the French government itself has been uh, hit with all kinds of condemnation and warnings about the conditions there. You know, it's, it's, it's in France and it's reported to be among the worst refugee camps in the world. And that's quite a... Uh, span of of candidates, uh, you know, in terms of bad refugee camps, um, and and uh, I, yeah, it seems like no improvements are made. I, I I heard the stories this year about the, you know, a, a focus on maybe having some heaters. I don't know if that ended up happening, but indeed, you know, from your Instagram, I saw even a lot of those cases of fire. Then we yeah. we have very recently the Paris attacks, and again on that night, you know, I I thought of you in terms of. 
among the bogus or bizarre uh, and, and no, unfounded stories that came out were some stories of people attacking the camp or something crazy happening in Calais among uh, out of what's already a terrible situation and people claim that the camps had been set on fire by angry French people um, and it was one of those cases where I I, I just thought like I, I, I would look to Shafir right now or I would look to people who are actually visiting the camps as observers, as, as volunteers, to really tell me what's going on because a lot of what's reported about it is so just shallow, just, you know, quick cursory, oh, there's a fire, it must be this, it must be, you know, quick conclusions. Absolutely. There's, there's definitely an attempt to stigmatize uh, people now after Paris, as you say. And, uh, you know, if you visit the camp and if you visit the volunteers working there, it, it's a tremendous kind of sense of camaraderie and a, and a sense of joint struggle. Um, and this kind of nastiness, uh, I hope it just exists in cyberspace and in, in, in Twitter feeds and so on. But of course, it, uh, the reality is different. Um, there are people who will exploit such situations. Um, these are vulnerable people. They're not fanatics. They don't want to, they want to uh, live here. They want to, you know, because the conditions that they're facing back home are, uh, are intolerable. They have, you know, they don't yearn for their country of origin. They have no country to go back to. Yeah. Uh, many of them come from destroyed countries. So, um, yeah, uh, there will always be people who exploit uh, vulnerable people. Yeah. And yet, yet you do always, always hear that that almost discussion as if it's a real option of sending people back. The Dutch government at, right now, you hear a lot about what they're going to do about who is going to be able to stay and what kind of refugees they'll send back, back in, in you know, qu quotation marks. I mean, wherever back is, if that's even possible. And people very much act like that's an, an option, like a, you know, might be a suitable option somehow. And it's a, it's a fairly depressing situation. Um, but yeah, during the Paris attacks, that was the, that this, among the stories that kept getting shared, you know, the, the one time anybody seems to care, at least in my feed about, uh, Calais and it's, it's these sort of completely unfounded stories. Uh, sure. Uh, I, I, I don't know if you've seen that graphic mark of, uh, the country of Lebanon, uh, placed beside, uh, a county called Cornwall, which is just a small part of England. And the graphic states that Lebanon has taken two million Syrian refugees. Mm. And yet Cornwall, which is just, you know, uh, uh, just a small portion of, of the UK, uh, well, the feeling here is that we can only take 20,000 and that's only over five years. Yeah. The, the fact of the matter is people flee war, people run away from war. It's a physiological response. This is what will happen if there's war. You just got to understand it. And for a, a continent, Europe, you know, with 508 million people, I think uh, I read the statistic somewhere, to be concerned about such small numbers, it's uh, beyond me. Yeah. Um, you know, Shafir, I don't want to make you go through all the paces in terms of the work that you've done in the last few years in, in one podcast. So I'll, I'll kind of wind it down, but sure. you, you mentioned, and I didn't even realize that was the connection, but Libya, right? You've done work involving Libya. And what I didn't expect that you just said is that in fact, uh, Libya is connected to the Bangladesh case when it comes to migration. Ah, uh, look, I'm never surprised by the complicated ways the world works, but in this case, you got to explain this to me. Um, uh, I, I know that at some point Libya had a lot of guest workers. Qaddafi was somewhat famous for that. Um, uh, is, is this part of that? Um, way back, uh, Gaddafi had a lot of uh, guest workers, uh, to use that term, uh, from Bangladesh working in the oil fields. But of course, the, the things have changed. Bangladeshis simply want to get out of the country. And there are many traffickers who will help yeah. them get out of the country. Um, so some of the people I've interviewed didn't realize that they were going to end up in Libya. They had no idea. They're illiterate people. They're, they're just told, with this visa, you get a job once you land. Um, and once they land, there are no jobs, no nothing. 
Some landed in Mombasa, then had to make the trek to, to Libya in order to cross to Lampedusa. Some landed in Italy, uh, sorry, in, uh, in, uh, in Libya. They had no work. They ended up in detention camps, um, uh, and then they uh, get out. By the way, getting out from a detention camp is is another one of these things uh, why um, migration is such a, a money earner for certain types of people, for traffickers. So, yes, um, Bangladeshis are basically picked up by traffickers, they're dropped in Russia, they're dropped in Turkey, they're dropped in Libya, and then they're just told, get on with it, mate. Yeah. I, I remember, what was it part of, um, y you had produced, and I've, I'm sure you've done a lot more since then, there were actually conversations with traffickers or, or people along the chain, if I can call it that, um, that would do exactly what you just described, uh, uh, you know, taking a sum of money from people in Bangladesh and then passing them off to someone else. And, and they end up in, at that time, it was a story of the Gulf states, I believe. Um, yeah. Man, this is a class of people. Uh, I, I suppose, yeah, your your work still you still have encounters uh, related, at least, to traffickers. It, it seems like we're in an era where their business is booming. They may be multiplying in terms of the amount of people getting into it, and it's such a hard to reach, hard to hard to really expose uh, field or, or industry. It seems. It is. I mean, for example, in Libya, Mark, um, a lot of the detention camps, um, by the way, these detention camps were set up by European money. Right. Uh, so, for example, there's a big uh, container uh, detention camp in Abu Sharta in the Garian Mountains in Libya, which I visited uh, with uh, basically the, these are containers where people are kept. Um, and in that detention camp, uh, Mark, there was no central government money to, pr to feed the prisoners. Uh, the, the camp wardens were feeding the prisoners out of their pocket money. Now, is this altruism? Of course not, because the, the pocket money is not quite pocket money. It's, it's basically the money he earns from selling migrants or getting migrants to cough up for their release and so on. So if you look along the chain, it's just absolutely astonishing uh, uh, how perverse it became. Uh, not just the trafficker who takes the money from the migrant, but also the entire detention camp system, which also reaches back to Europe and what Europe had in mind when it was building detention camps in North Africa with Gaddafi's help. Yeah, and, and now you do hear about uh, the attempts by the European Union to make a so-called new approach to to migration, and one of the areas uh, usually lower on the list of things they're going to do, and that people don't talk about as much, is dedicate more money to that goes to third or not third party, but other countries. Turkey being one of the big ones, and I kind of wonder if we're not actually at a point where now more similar style uh, systems or or you know more money is going to go towards unknown run detention camps in countries where the EU has no no oversight and, and, and many of us will never hear about what's going on there. Absolutely. There's one document uh, which was unearthed by Italian journalists where they found that the Italian government had provided 1,000 body bags to Libya. So this is the stuff. This is the kind of stuff we're going to unearth, I think. Um, we see barbed wire on television but we don't see body bags. And I think there are a lot of, uh, yeah, yeah, this is the kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I myself, um, I don't always know, you know, the answers to many of these issues in the world. Although, you know, the more we talk about it, the more we learn, the more you start to see uh, maybe not the solutions, but at least the cause of many of the problems, I feel. Uh, but I, I wonder, you know, he, a lot of the stories over the years have been about people because they're desperate, because situations get so bad in terms of income, but also safety, um, that they fall into the the traffickers. Is has there ever been? Is there a growing sort of awareness, or even within education? Let's go back to Bangladesh, where young people, even adults, get 
taught or shown the dangers and perhaps, you know, is there any way to... I understand the EU connection, I understand the government level, and I'm kind of wondering if there's any way to get people to to be more prepared for the, the not to go with such options, especially when it comes to, you know, being taken to all corners of the world that are is not where you want to go and it's you're just being taken advantage of. Absolutely. And I think this is very, very pressing. The government doesn't really do these things because uh, it's a huge money earner. Mm. People going abroad, they will send back money and it's all good. It's all hunky-dory. And the few cases which are problematic, you know, they, there's no need to worry about them. There's, you know, uh, people are not concerned about poor people dying. So in Bangladesh, there have been some initiatives. For example, the Bangladesh Rural Action Committee, BRAC, uh, they are... They are holding workshops to tell uh, people who are thinking about migrating, uh, look, these are the loopholes. You mustn't hand over your passport. You mustn't hand over your money. They're taking them through each and every step of the process and telling them what the potential dangers are. But these are limited initiatives. BRAC, even though it's a huge organization, I'm not sure how much reach they have. Uh, with so many workers going abroad. So I think it's a drop in the ocean, really. Mm. There has to be a concerted uh, campaign, much like a public health campaign, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, to, to tell people of the dangers of migration, especially women going to Gulf countries. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it, we hear these horror stories, and that's all there is to it. The press exposes it, and that's it. But there's not, nothing more sustained to, to teach people that, uh, wait, you should reconsider or you should uh, know what the pitfalls are. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that would also, well, save lives, you know, essentially. Yeah. And that's part of, I think, many of our concerns as we watch what's going on in the world. Uh, our priority for many of us is how, how can we save lives? You know? <laughs> but, yeah. but unfortunately, everything gets sort of manipulated, including myself some days. I, I, I can fall for some stories. And yeah, you know, social media back in the day, this is a larger discussion, but we really thought, I thought uh, more information about the world, uh, more ability to share this can only be good for decreasing conflicts and increasing understanding that's going to be good for, uh, across the board. And now we arrive, you know, 2015 and, and what we've seen going on. And I am no longer convinced about what I thought regarding social media. I guess I shouldn't have been so uh, naive as far as that it's a tool. Uh, but I, when I look at what's going on, the way mm, the mass majority, let's say, people use these tools, it's not increasing safety, quality of life around the world. Yeah, I, I, I take your point, Mark. But at the same time, again, if we look at the instance of Bangladesh, uh, what has it done? It has, in the last three weeks, banned WhatsApp, banned Viber, and ba banned uh, Facebook. Hmm. Um, and it was in preparation for hanging to uh, Islamist politicians who were found guilty in the in the compromise, shall we say, war crimes tribunal. So, in some parts of the world, these sources, if you like, social media, are still the sources that people turn to to get the information, mm -hmm. uh, to get the you know what is actually happening. Um, the Bangladesh government have actually said to Facebook that we want you to uh, install an admin in Bangladesh and stories we don't like, you'll kill. Wow. I mean, wow. yeah. <laughs> so, so do you see what I mean? In fact, they're holding a meeting today with three ministers. Facebook are holding a meeting, I believe it's today, with three ministers regarding what to do about Facebook in Bangladesh. Yeah. I mean, huge numbers of Bangladeshis use Facebook, not just as a means of social communication, but also to access news. Yeah. Um, and uh, they have this kind of new instant journalism thing that right. Facebook will to do instant articles. It's all come a cropper because the Bangladesh government have decided it doesn't like negative stories. And there, of course, there are lots of negative stories at the moment. Um, so, yeah, I, I take your point, but in, I think in some places it's, uh, it's still useful. Yeah. Yeah, I think media literacy is what I mean, yeah, everybody always says, you know, the internet is young and we as users are also still in the primordial ooze of how to do this. And I think it's like definitely time. We need to learn more about 
how the tools work. Yeah, even what you just mentioned, you know, agreements that are being made that manipulate the the, the information that comes through these tools in certain directions. Um, yeah. Because we, yeah, I think we need to be more critical of how the tools work, what they're being used for, and what they could be used for. And this sort of, it is like a public health kind of campaign that I'm I'm thinking about here. Uh, let me, maybe we can end today with, with me asking you, Yourself as a as a human on Earth that that you know has uh, uh, responsibilities in your own home and and as a as a observer of the world, uh, does it work for you in terms of you know I see you've got the projects I know that not all projects are uh, you know earn any yep. you know in order to exist. Does it work for you? The have you established a sort of balance in? being able to live um, and support the people you need to support and also do the work you love to do? How is that balance going? No, I think that's a very important question for all documentary makers, perhaps uh, all freelance kind of journalists. Um, uh, look, I mean, the way we finance the work is we, we do quite mundane things um, a lot of the time. Uh, and in our case, we were very lucky to have Actually, not a mundane thing at all, but a long-term project with the National Health Service in England, which was very interesting. And then we try and siphon off some of that money to do the kind of projects that we want to do. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, with, uh, with Italian public TV. Uh, so we hire ourselves out so that we can do the kind of things that we want. And, and it's not always possible to finish. There are projects which I'd love to finish and I just haven't been able to finish them. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a constant kind of uh, problem, I have to say. It's a matter of writing grants all the time, right. uh, applications all the time. But, you know, I'm buoyed by the stories I hear and I think that's what, you know, drives us. I'm sure it, that's what motivates you. Uh, the people that I encounter, um, you know, Bangladesh is going through extremely troubled times, a lot of unresolved conflicts, violence, political vendettas, disappearances, communalism, censorship, you name it, it's going through everything. So, but, but as I said to you, these things excite me yeah. and these things motivate me. So I hope I can continue. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think you're doing fantastic. And I, I, I hope that translates to you also being able to relax occasionally. And, and, you know, if it's a cup of coffee that you want or whatever it is that you should be able to also have a, a certain quality of life uh, that you, you desire in all this. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, Shafir, thanks so much for, for taking the time today. I will provide a, a list of links um, and uh, keep on keeping on, sir. It's really a pleasure to hear from you and that we've kept in touch all these years, even if it's just through technology, is still fantastic. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks. I always appreciate uh, talking to you. Thanks for Cheers. Much and we'll check back in in May for the, for the exciting yes. news. Yes, yes. Let's do that. All right. Cheers. Okay. Shafir Rahman is a London-based documentary producer and citizen of the world. that about does it for today's edition of the Realities Podcast. A reminder that links to all of Shafir Rahman's uh, projects, including the crowdfunding project that you can still get involved in, they will be available on the website realitiespodcast.com. Brand new website, new look for a new program with lots of guests to come in 2016. Took me a little while to get it going uh, clearly, uh, now we will start to move, having different guests on different topics, all explaining their realities and what's going on in this world and, and why they do what they do. Uh, so learning, that's what we're doing on this program, and I'm very glad to have you along for the ride. You can also find us on Facebook, Realities Podcast, and Twitter, uh, Realities Cast. We're there. We're around. And I'm very glad to have you along. Until next time, I'm Mark Fonseca Rendeiro. Thanks for listening. Um.
Um, right. But I, I suppose we should set it up for people who don't normally read or watch what's going on in Bangladesh. So it's 2007. If you could give me a little snapshot. You were just in Dakar, Dakar last week, right? Mm, that's uh, right. Give me a little snapshot of what life is like uh, in the city, for example. What are people doing for work? Um, what kinds of scenes do you see? I've seen some photos on your blog. I mean, it is fascinating to see some of these things. Um, yeah. Sure, sure. I think the emergency that uh, there's a state of emergency at the moment that took place last month.